Well, thank you all for coming. Um, we are uh, going to get into continuing engagement. And I first want to thank our workshop series sponsor, Siemens, who will be sponsoring the entire year of workshops. And that's really awesome. So we're happy to have them with um, their support. So we can go on to the next one. I'll let you all kind of introduce yourself since there's a long list of folks. Um, So we're going to talk about uh, community engagement from a little bit of a different standpoint than we did last year and really um, taking a different view and engaging the youth is kind of a big focus and then different tools of how we can engage our community members. And I think admittedly, uh, Green Sub Cities is maybe re is, is due for a, a revamp of this particular best practice as we think about um, you know, bringing our youth on board, thinking about underrepresented populations, um, and equity concerns as well, or, or even just different languages and, and how we uh, communicate some of the things that are going on in our cities and try to solicit feedback. And so today we're just going to focus on, um, you know, as I mentioned, the youth and, and some of the tools that are available out there, and then some of the things that we've been working on developing as well um, through Green Sub Cities to help sort of really drive the program as being a community program and not just something that sits with an individual uh, at City Hall. So uh, with that, Kristen Rose uh, is going to introduce and welcome to everyone. Okay, so I think I'm going to focus today on the local and maybe on the webinar too. Um, and one of the first things we wanted to do, which doesn't really align with community engagement, maybe in a way, um, is to go over the new welcome guide that we just created. Um, and this is a tool that is used, will hopefully be used for brand new Green Step Cities, um, new to the program, kind of as a, as a guide to really integrate into the program. And then also for transitioning kind of staff. So the program's been for a few years now, and we're starting to see staff turn over at the city. Um, so people that have been involved since day one um, are now transitioning into two new staff um, that may not be familiar with the program. So they're coming in um, with absolutely no background as to what Green Step Cities is and what the history of the city um, projects are. And so this guide is hopefully um, something that can be used for both of those. So we will get it pulled up here. I clicked organizer. We're good. We have audio. Hi, okay. people out there. Sorry and welcome. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Should we continue? I'll keep up. Um, in my bag. Okay. Great. So first I will go... Perfect. So this guy was uh, 
emailed out to the email listserv a week or two ago. Um, we do have a link for it. The easiest way for cities to probably find us is to go on to the Green Step City web page and go on to your city login. Um, in there, there are there's a document um, tab up at the top. And then you scroll all the way down to the bottom at Other, and you'll find the Welcome Guide uh, under that. So I hate to take the mouse from you, but oh, please do. Okay. <laughs> All right. So you can see the table of contents up here. Uh, and the table of contents is great because if you have a question on what's step three, how do I get there, just click on it from the table of contents. It'll take you right down to that section. Uh, underneath the table of contents, we've got just a quick resource guide. These are some of the most used tools that you might be looking for. Uh, and I should back up and say this guide is not ideally used as something to be printed out uh, because it is full of links. So it's going to have all that information right there for you to just click and go to exactly what it is you're looking for. Just a quick overview. Um, just general training materials that might be out there for green staff cities. And then I think one of the important questions for new cities or transitioning, transitioning staff is to really think about where's your city at? Why did you join this program? Uh, where are you at in your step process? What projects have you completed? And why? And so this kind of gives some background on, on specific reasons as to why your city might be involved. You as a coordinator, you as a coordinator are, are doing this for your city. And so really going back and thinking about why it is that the city council signed that resolution is an important step. And then this section gets into the nitty gritty on, on this step. So um, general resources, especially for step one, on how to get started, use your login page. And then I'll get into steps two and three, which are looking at best practices, what is your city category and how to find that out? How many best practices are required for um, each step? And then how do you report? And who do you report to? Step four and five are, are um, transitioning from those best practice actions and going to the metrics and setting goals. And so just an overview of what that means. And then the next section is going to be going through step by step. What is each web page on on the website? Um, what do they mean? What resources are on there? Let's do the best practices again. You can click on this, and it'll take you directly to that best practice on the website. Contact um, as well as staff and partners. So I think you hear a lot about these partners that that work with Green Step Cities. Who are they? What do they do? And what can they help you with? Um, and who are the best contacts for that are all right here. Data entry. Um, we put this in here because we have a lot of cities use a lot of different ways to put their um, data for Green Step Cities in um, through city staff, through interns, through community organizers, um, high school students. Etc. Et so these just give a list of ideas of, of where your city might um, look to actually be completing the work. Additional online resources, social media, and listserv. Um, this is something we'll be talking about later today. And so you need to find us on Facebook or Twitter. Or if you're not on the email listserv, um, this explains how to get on that. If you aren't on the email listserv, you can let any of us know today too, and we can get you on there as well. Um, connection to cities, uh, other communities, other Green Step cities that are doing projects. Uh, we find that a lot of our cities and um, really go to that peer-to-peer -peer learning more so more so than coming to um, technical staff. And so definitely you want to encourage and utilize um, what your peers have done. And then finally, just reporting and recognition. How do you report? Again, this is kind of this is a also in that step section, but just a general recap. And then what is recognition? How do you get it? Uh, and how do you promote uh, the recognition that you've received in your community through social media, newsletters, etc. Um, and links to 
um, all kinds of examples. So that is that. Any questions on the welcome guide? Again, I just wanted to give a quick overview. Um, ideally, in the next few weeks, we're also going to do something similar, but geared towards elected officials. <coughs> um, so for those um, working in cities that have a little bit different role in Green Step Cities, um, and so that they can get a little bit of background on, on the work that you guys are doing. So I think I can call that a bit. I'm going to let you take it back. Actually, we're going to click on the second link. Yeah. Okay, I'm back. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the first section that we're going to be talking about today is youth involvement and youth engagement at the cities. Um, mostly through sustainability, I, but also just in general, how to get youth involved in, in city government. So, we're excited to announce a new best practice action. This is 24.6. Um, and so what we did, we kind of did, we took some bits and pieces from other best practice actions and then we created some new ones and we put them all into 24.6. And so this one is called um, Engage Community Youth and College Students by Creating Opportunities to Participate in City Government. And so um, you'll find some implementation tools just like all the other best practices. Um, we've got iMatter on there, which you'll hear from, and yes, um, which you'll hear from today. We have examples of uh, youth councils, youth commissions, really getting involved in government operations. We will also hear from today. Um, and then National League of Cities has a guide for um, youth civic engagement as well. Thank you. The star level example. We can not. We can. We can skip zooming in. I'll read it to you. <laughs> um, we've got one, two, and three stars, just like every other best practice action. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so star one is going to be student involvement in Youth and City Government Day, which is uh, something that you'll see not too often. I don't think I see it very much around Minnesota, but it is something that you'll see across the country. Um, but it's generally just uh, kind of field trip day for students to come and learn about city government, um, sit down at the podium and, and do some um, government um, things in the city. Uh, and then we have student group engaged with the city on a project. Uh, so that can be anything. Um, again, it doesn't have to be sustainability oriented. Um, for some of these, it specifically is. But for others, we're just trying to encourage Involvement, uh, in government operations. Using a student or an intern to help with Green Step action entry. Uh, so that's one of the things we talked about um, in that welcome guide before. Um, and then for anything that's um, working specifically with schools, that's going to be under 24.4. So that is going to be separate. For two stars, we have student involvement in the city green committee or commission. Um, so having a student uh, participate in in that group, um, <coughs> organized in the city. Um, we have separate youth student committee or commission. This is one that can be very broad, not specific to sustainability, um, but we would obviously encourage sustainability to be touched on uh, at time to time in that group. So the high school student internships offered in city government. We have formal city volunteer program focused on youth. And then for three stars, we have three or more youth students involved in iMatter or something similar. Um, youth group working directly with your city council, and we'll hear a little bit more about iMatter uh, just in a bit, and so you'll understand more about what we mean on that. And then we have separate youth student committee or commission that includes at least one city staff or council member, and this is something that would be specific sustainability, um, environmental issues. And then the last one we have is a regular student intern or intern to work on sustainability issues at the city. Um, so again, you can think high school, college, um, for that. And then finally, 
doing it? No one, because this is brand new. So if you're doing any of these things, go ahead and mark um, in the Green Step City's login page the action you've <coughs> taken already. Again, where we've taken retroactive action. So if you've been doing it, definitely get that in there. And if not, we would encourage you to take a look at this and see what you might be able to do. Okay, no that one. And with that, we're going to go on to our first presenter. So you can stop hearing from me today. Where city staff like recycling coordinators will go out to a high school or elementary school and, and work, or maybe uh, uh, come speak to an ecology class, or really to a city staff supporting what's happening in the school, what is happening in the school. What this new action really aims to um, sort of challenge cities to do is think about um, oh, we have all this talent and energy of uh, students who can actually be engaging with us and helping us in the city. So it's it's sort of the directionality of sort of help in a sense. It's really, it's really students is using help in the city. So that's why we felt like, wow, it's, it's just crucial, really. I mean, cities need all the help they can get. So. Exactly. And these are yeah, your next employees um, to be working as a city. So the earlier that we can get them involved in understanding city government operations, um, the, the more we have great talent coming to our city and um, down the road. Kristen, we shouldn't forget all the community colleges that are located out in our communities, as well as like students going to the U of M that might need an internship that are like could easily get back to your city. Um, so, uh, and we have a lot of new graduates that don't have jobs yet that are looking for internships. Yeah, exactly. There are definitely opportunities out there, and if we need any help connecting with those, we can. Um, hope guide you in those directions. So. With that, uh, I've mentioned I a couple of times, so I'm going to introduce Larry Kraft, who um, will start us out on a presentation and then hand it over. Um, and I won't even say any more. Um, I think iMatter has done some great work. I used to work in the city of Elk River and helped start an iMatter group up there, which, uh, as far as I know, is still going well. Um, and so I'm excited to hear from Larry again. Great. Uh, thank you all. Um, great to be here. And, and yes, I'm doing a bait and switch. <laughs> but uh, you get the benefit of the switch being far better the bait. <laughs> so uh, this uh, this is Sophia Skinner. Um, so Sophia, I'll do a little bit, and then she can introduce herself. Um, uh, recently graduated from St. Louis Park High School and was one of the leaders in the team that um, that you'll hear about in the, in the presentation here a, a bit. Um, and she continues to be involved in iMatter now as a program facilitator, helping other youth in this area um, do some things. Um, so let me introduce yourself before I, before I, if you want to add? Thank you for your introduction, Larry. Um, yes, uh, my name is Sophia Skinner, and as mentioned, I was one of the students who was involved in uh, presenting to the St. Louis Park City Council uh, last year. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, I'm technically the executive director of iMatter, more like chief mentor. Uh, I'm going to share with you a video, but before that, um, iMatter was founded about 10 years ago by a 13-year-old. Um, and uh, he got involved after seeing Al Gore's initial movie, Inconvenient Truth, blown away by it, decided he wanted to start speaking about it, applied to Gore's organization to get trained and was turned down because they said he was there's now uh, a couple years later a, a fun video of Al Gore introducing Alec after that <laughs> and, and saying the mistake that he made. And there's no longer an age restriction at, uh, at climate reality. But um, Alec's message, and you'll hear him a little bit here in the video, was really about to, to peers that they are the moral authority on this and people will listen to them. Uh, and then because of that, uh, you know, it, it's kind of their responsibility, it's their calling. This generation is really place and gets it in a way that older generations don't. And so what iMatter has done over the past couple of years is, is take those core things, and Alec is still very much involved as in our advisory board of doing video work, and, and really have um, focused our efforts at kind of the intersection of climate change and, and city activism. 
So you know, our efforts now really have focused on helping young people like, like Sophia and peers that have incredible power, helping them find that power and leveraging it um, at the city level. Uh, and uh, we've seen some really um, fun results here in Minnesota and elsewhere in the country. So with that, um, I'll stop most of my talking and I <laughs> Right. So this video is going to be about the, um, it was done a little bit over a year ago, about the campaign that we launched that has become really this iMatter program focused on cities. So. We'll just, um, I can tell you a little bit about what's in it, and, and then we can get to Sophia. So, can you it again? Try it again. Oh, sorry, she clicked off of the. Sorry, one sec. Do you know what the um, what the audio is supposed to be like? What it's called? of the future, 
it just, you know, there's a built-in power to that that you may not even realize you have. And the time is now to come together as a united force to ensure a livable future for us, for your children, for your grandchildren, and for the generations to come. The time is now to create a sustainable future. We are the transitional generation, the last to be born into a system that is failing us and the first to enter the regenerative and sustainable world that we all know is possible. So join us. You can learn more about the I Matter Now campaign and get started today by visiting imatteryouth.org. All right, we've got another 40 seconds or so that is the mayor of St. Louis Park talking about um, Sophia's group after everything had happened. I found it. I'll also say I've been lobbied by a lot of people before. This was a textbook version of how to do this. And I mean this in the sense that frequently folks will come forward and they throw a whole bunch of specific things at us and they say, you should do this, 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 this. And then we end up getting bogged down in picking what should we be doing. Instead, what you came forward was you, were, you, know, you came forward with a really clear uh, vision for where we need to be. Um, you got us to commit to it, and now we just kick it over to staff to figure out how to make it happen. So <laughs> that's perfect. Well done. Um, but I, I mean that in all seriousness. I, I've been lobbied by a lot of professional lobbyists, and this was as good as they get. Sophia. So yes, my team. It was a roots and it was called Roots and Shoots. It was a Jane Goodall inspired environmental group, and we got involved with I Matter. Um, through our Environmental and Sustainability Commission. And with iMatter, we were able, this is our whole group here, um, we would meet every every week or so on Thursdays and talk about what we could do within our school. But we kind of felt in the beginning like our school wasn't really taking our passion seriously. And so when we got involved with iMatter, it was an excellent opportunity to have an impact beyond just our school borders. It was an opportunity to make a change within our broader community. And we would later find that it was um, more than our broader community. It was even statewide. Um, and so uh, we worked together with iMatter to draft this thing called a climate report card, which graded our city in five different areas. And then based on those areas, we calculated an overall average grade. And the average grade for St. Louis Park was a B minus. And this wasn't necessarily the best, but it gave our city kind of a place to start from and a path for improvement for the future. And as you can see, their feedback for us was so ecstatic. They were so happy that these young people were speaking up for what they believed in, and they were so supportive of um, the entire process of getting there. So this was, this is the report card here, and then this is us presenting to the city council the faithful day. <laughs> Very nerve-wracking, but um, very, very empowering for all, each of us as um, as young people working for um, climate justice. Um, and then paired with the report card was uh, something that we drafted called the Climate Inheritance Resolution. And the Climate Inheritance Resolution worked with the report card because it committed our city to working in three specific areas. One was reaching net zero emissions by 2040 working with youth to develop that climate action plan based on the report card and beginning within 30 days of it being passed. So this climate inheritance resolution was signed and was passed for the first time ever by a unanimous vote in St. Louis Park, which was a really big deal. And um, it brought about so much happiness for our group to know that we could do it, that we put our mind to something, we worked really hard, and then these were the results. So um, and we like to think of this as kind of the starting point to a bigger ripple effect. That's what we like to call it, the ripple effect, because um, this was just the beginning to um, a longer journey for our group to make changes um, in different states, to make changes even in our own state. And so one of the first things that um, resulted from our presentation was we received the Green Difference Award presented by Green Schools, and we are invited to travel to Boston to receive it as a group. Um, and we made a lot of connections there. And then we also presented at the Minnesota State Fair uh, shortly after, 
and we got connected to these people who run something called the Adirondack Youth Climate Summit. And they're really inspired by our story and what we did as youth, and they wanted us to come and do a workshop at their summit. And so all of us were invited to New York, which was really fun. We stayed in this really quaint cabin. Um, it was such a wonderful experience. And in that meeting, actually, we got people to call their city governments, or not even people, we got youth, we got kids to call their city governments um, and start the process of getting their own climate inheritance resolutions passed. And that was so cool. Such a great event. Um, and then, so we had traveled to Boston, we had traveled to New York, and we, we were wondering, like, okay, we've done these things in other states. Now, how can we get the youth involved in our state? And so what we did was we got together with all the people in Roots and Shoots, and they contacted all their friends that they knew in the different districts in Minnesota. And together we made a list, and we had this big kickoff meeting where we invited, I think, 10, uh, roughly 10 groups um, from different cities. Uh, in the Minnesota area, and we talked about what we had done in St. Louis Park, and we talked about how we would help them get involved if they wanted to do similar things. And so now these groups are involved, and they're currently in the process of either passing a climate inheritance resolution, uh, working on report cards, or just seeing what they can do within their communities to create uh, more, uh, more environmental awareness and activism. And it's a really beautiful thing because these youth, they're, they're putting into the world so much stories of empowerment. And just in Minnesota alone, they're, like, they're actively changing the world. And I think that there's something so beautiful about that, that just something so small can mean something so big. Yeah, so this is uh, just a, a, a quick snapshot of some of the places where there has been some activity. Um, and uh, one I, I want to mention also um, is, uh, and this came indirectly as a result of what happened at St. Louis Park, um, someone in Citizens Climate Lobby who uh, knew, knew about things happening at St. Louis Park talked to Olya, 11-year-old Olya Wright, uh, who had started a Nordic nature group up in Grand Marais of uh, kids ranging through the age between 8 and 9 and 14. And she and her mom contacted, contacted us, and they got involved. And they did something similar to what the St. Louis Park group did. Uh, and they uh, presented a report card, uh, but convinced their city council to pass the, the similar resolution on the same day of, of the report card in February earlier this year. And then um, Molly was then kind of deputized by her city council, and she's gone out and is uh, helping them find funding for a coordinator that's going to do both Green Step Cities and the Climate Action Plan implementation. So um, I connected her with the Knight Foundation and the folks I work with there um, who still rave about the conference calls they've had. But there's a bunch of other stuff going on. There's, uh, I have a short, there's a, a, a information page that's over there for you to pick up. Mention what other high schools in the Twin Cities are connected to? Yes, yeah, there's a couple of teams. Um, St. Paul, Hopkins, Apple Valley, Rosemount. Uh, where else? Um, so I'm not sure about. We we'll talked to someone at Rosemount. I know they haven't done it, but there's Bloomington, Medina, Bean um, Prairie. Bean Prairie, yes. Yeah. So those are the uh, not I just have to add that <clears throat> Olya Wright gave me a, a call. I was just in my office one day, and <laughs> Olya called and said, you know, we don't, we don't have like a job description. So Green Step, the, the climate work gets like, we need a job description for someone who would help grammar A. And like, where is that? <laughs> and I said, Wow, geez, I'm embarrassed. No, it doesn't exist. So between all you and I, we created something. We put it on the admin page for Green Step Cities, uh, a little sort of like half page. What would be those simple things that a small town of, what is Grand Marais, three? Yeah, 13 yeah. small town. You know, what would a small town with a little bit of funding, uh, they're probably going to hire just their contract person, so obviously not going to get 
city staff person, but what would a person doing a little bit of work to sort of follow through on sort of the energy and the, the vision of OVIA and the city council? Uh, so, it, yeah, it's just, again, a great example of power and uh, confidence and the sort of thing that, you know, we, we want to do. And, and, and what, I, what I would add on to that is, you know, so, uh, you know, we, I, we, we work for them, right? We work for her and for, for Olia. Uh, and, uh, and they, it, it's, the, it's the youth that are really passionate about this. Uh, and so with Olia and with Sophia, I mean, it's been advising and consulting a bit and giving you some guidance and answering questions. But it's, with, it's, what, it's what is within them that drives the success. Because it, it needs to be that authentic way I want to do something about this, not what we tell them to do. And, and uh, I have been on many of those kinds of conversations with all the others kind of, uh, and, and youth can do this so well, just ask the obvious question, and when you then try to go, uh, when there's not a good answer other than I didn't do it. No, could you also share a bit about how youth can be involved in making sure that climate action plans get implemented and helping to mobilize. It's like a lot of work to reduce carbon by 80 percent and like how would it stay connected over time? Yeah, so what Sophia mentioned was that one of the their demands was that youth are involved. So I loved seeing the the, the stars and the green step cities thing um, because uh, you know, in St. Louis Park, there's two youth seats on the Environment Sustainability Commission. I think that's a great model. Um, in fact, that's how I got connected to the Roots and Shoots group. Uh, and so, when we are working with people like Sophia and Olio, we say, look, the, the thing that's, that we've learned is very compelling is when you go and you say, you know, not just we're pointing to the problem, but so those kinds of things um, are, are really important. And then um, the other thing that we've done is you know, this, the iMatter is, is talked about as a program, not a campaign. So and it's set up now, and, and Sophia is, in a sense, facilitating mentoring another group of students that, as opposed to starting from saying, boy, you need to do a report card, it, it starts from where is your city now, what needs to happen in it, and, and how can we do that? So. For example, working with a group in Minneapolis, and there there is a climate action plan. So they're now push they're going to push for some things to improve the climate action plan, and then stay involved. No, that was a really great summary. <laughs> yeah. With the, we had one resolution and we presented it to the city council and um, it was mainly comprised, uh, yeah, if you could pull it up, that'd be great, um, of those three areas that I mentioned. Um, if you're asking about, are you asking about the parts of the resolution? Yeah, I want to know what kind of action is the city going to be doing? Um, so we are actually working with the city still and they've drafted up a climate action plan, which we still have yet to look at. Okay. Um, and so that was because one of the things that the city committed to when they signed the resolution was that they had to work with youth to develop that climate action plan. And so that's that's what we're that's the current work that we're doing. So this is it signed, and um, there's a little bit about those three areas that we mentioned. So uh, this, this is three areas. Three areas. Three areas. Three areas. The three areas that we said were develop a climate action plan that. That addresses the report card, and really that was net zero by 2040. Youth involved and start in 30 days, and they did that. Um, Abby is here with Great Plains Institute, has been the partner of the city developing the St. Louis Park Climate Action Plan that is almost ready for release. And, and some, um, and uh, the team, the Sophia's team at the St. Louis Park High School will be involved in a rollout of the plan. In fact, I think that's the number one action suggested of the, you know, how to get started fast is a community engagement process with 
you know, people working with businesses because that's the biggest generator of emissions. That was uh, the biggest, the biggest issue, which is, which when they did the report card, then it focused the students' attention was the fact that there was no climate action plan. There was a inventory, a greenhouse gas inventory, but there was no climate action plan. And the report card is a tool that developed with youth input, but also was based on the science of um, of Dr. Jim Hansen, and a few years ago put out a recipe that that said, uh, here's what it would take to, to bring the Earth back into energy balance. So that, that's what the great debate was. There's a criteria for that. Or is it D minus? How do you get a D minus or how do you get a C? Yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a criteria. With, with the report card comes along the report, the detailed report. Describes the grades and the grading system. And so there was a lot of student research to help with that grade. The, the student research, um, this was uh, someone else on the team worked with someone at the city government to fill out a questionnaire that had the data needed for the report. Was this a tool uh, offered by iSeater or is this something that Can you just mention how this can connect with um, the 20 recovery plan? I'm actually going to cut you off. Yeah. Yeah. So we can take questions at the end. Okay, yeah. um, okay. Can you just real quick that there's a, I'll just do it really quick, that there's a, a Minneapolis-based cohort of groups starting um, in, at the beginning of October that uh, Sophia is leading as a program facilitator. Um, and so if Like an advisor, like for you know, a club or 
and the Honor Society, and they would then make us available for students in their, in their school. And we provide uh, resources and textbook experts, and each of the programs have been available for 10 years. We have a lot of great examples and project guides on how to get a project going off the ground. Um, it's very hands-on, experiential learning. Uh, we provide project seed funds. Uh, we uh, been fortunate to have dollars from the Environment Natural Resources Trust Fund and recommended by the Public Citizen Business Commission on Natural Resources or LCCMR. Um, and also the McKnight Foundation is able to provide those seed funds so that when the students have, have ideas and they have a project in mind, they have the dollars that they can implement. So these get them started. And this has also been helpful for us as well. So this is we're organized right now. We have it's a program of Prairie Woods Environmental Learning Center, and we started ten years ago in Prairie Woods in Spicer, Minnesota. Um, and then we have partners with Nine Angel Centers, which is down in southern Minnesota, Lake Country Service Cooperative, which is in Fergus, and then Laurentian Environmental Center, which is way up in the north in Britt, Minnesota. And each cohort has approximately ten to twelve teams, and within that. There, there's a coordinator, correction coordinator, and they help reach out to the schools. So they'll meet with the schools, they'll meet with the, the YES team. A team is usually consisted of 10 to 12 students. That's a different club, but oftentimes it's part of a classroom. And in some cases, like the Westwood Walnut Grove, it is a class. Because of the success of the program, it really met the needs of a class, a science class, that was really focused on hands on. Those are the types of the structure of yes. And then right now I'm the program manager and I'm office in at Prairie Lake and Spicer. So I went through and looked at uh, the subsidies that are currently active right now and the, the activities that we have. So the ones in green are where we overlap between a green subsidy and a yes team that could work with it well together. The Royalton team has been very instrumental in working with the city council and with Mayor Andrea Lauer. They present um, at the city council when they have an active process going on with all the All right, over the last 10 years, uh, we've completed over a thousand action projects. We've worked with over 5,000 local businesses and organizations, impacting over 125,000 community members. Over 100, uh, we said 114 action projects, and um, representing over 50 communities. Even though we have 30 teams right now, we, we represent over 50 communities because we're, a lot of our teams, or most of our teams, are in Greater Minnesota. So you'll have New London, Spicer, Atwater, Cosmo, and Rose, and City. So it's, you know, it's a conglomerate of uh, an area of regions that are coming together for that. And we have uh, very have a good volunteer base. A lot of those volunteers are businesses that come in and present to students uh, or mentor them at different projects. Like how we did planting in, um, in North Kinder High School, the major pollinator planting project, and that was really instrumental with the volunteers in that community. And that's the guardian. And events. A lot of the students really get excited about hosting community events or events for elementary fun for them so they can go in and be the experts in the in their community and with the younger students. So a year in the life of yes is right now this is the fall when we're recruiting new teams and also retaining um, existing teams and we have a registration process. Uh, it's a simple form that gets signed by the principal and the teacher and then there is a, a participation fee that helps to cover costs that we don't have covered right now with the grants like for our fall summit coming up. And our fall summit and then during, um, and that's a fall summit, that's the kickoff, to get them excited about the project and the program, and it's a way to network with other teams. There's 30 teams across the state, we gather them together to show, help them feel the power that they have to work together towards this common mission. And throughout the year, they work on their action plans, and um, they set smart goals. Um, and then, uh, it's with those action items into, um, Plan to the project. And in, in, during the winter, we do workshops, and those are focused on um, 
with the interest of the students, and I'll get more into that later. In the spring, we have a celebration where we have regional competitions, and then we also now have a statewide competition. This year, our health summit will be at St. John's, and we're going to kick it off with some mini uh, TED Talks about careers. And something we really try to do is inspire them that they can have a career in this field. Is sometimes we get this project that they're doing, but they can make this a career. We have one of our alumni at the University of Minnesota right now. And she was one of our first student leaders at Atwater College Grove, and she's working for the U of M, the solar section, and those teachers on our website, of course, and in the newspaper. So we, we want to really instill to them that this can be part of their future. Um, our theme this year is the Yes to Living Green, and we'll have various different sections that will be next. She's been a partner with us over the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> and then we're one of our major resource experts. Right now, I just have a series of slides. I um, wasn't able to bring in a student like Sophia. Um, <laughs> it's a really great way to do it. Um, but this is a quote from our students in different projects. And this was a group at, at Albany High School. And they put on a climate meeting with climate generation. We had 20 or 70 different community members that came in. There was a resource fair. Um, the mayor was there to welcome everyone. And then they shared their climate stories and the impact that they feel that climate change will have on them and why they feel so important that they want to be part of the solution. This is a student that did a planting at Sand Crane Meadows. And one of our young students is on the Sand Crane Meadows board. Really cool. So she was instrumental in getting mobilizing the youth in her community to come out and help to restore this prairie. Hydration stations, um, they've become very popular now, but when we first started them, um, well, we, got a, we became aware of them as being tour at St. Ben, and then we came back and we said, well, we probably installed over 30 hydration stations. Time they were really hip and happy with that. Now I think they're pretty This is our Glencoe Silver Lake team, and a lot of teams really get into the technology and they love to do super mileage cars, solar boats, and um, solar trailers. So you get a whole network of students that really want to explore that career and have a way to um, manifest it in a product. And so they build super mileage cars and they race them. And the way, so they're back on this one, just one quick note. So it's not how fast they go, it's how far they go on the least amount of gas. Yeah. An example of doing a winter workshop, we do tours of waste, the composting facilities, waste treatment plants, um, native gardens, and it's a way for students to really hear from experts and find a connection in their community with somebody that's helping them with the school. We find that often the things are in our backyard we don't know about. We went to the tour of the waste the energy facility in Alexandria with a teacher who had been in the community for 30 years. He said, I've driven by this for 30 years, but I've never even known what it was. So I gave him a pretty good opportunity to tour with his sixth grade student. This is a trade of a young man who took um, pop cans and made into a pop can solar heater to help keep their classroom. And I like this quote about leaving a legacy. I think, you know, it would be great when those kids drive by this someday in 20 years and that tree is still standing there and they're part of that, that legacy that they left behind. And a lot of these things that the project that they're doing, solar lit paths in the community, um, oil collection sites, these things will be there for a long time. Yes, we're really here to engage and empower the students 
and we find that it really helps to develop these leadership skills, community building, teamwork, problem solving. So it's really up to the youth to let the eye matter. You know, the youth come up with the ideas and the projects, and we're there to help guide them and as coaches that do. But the best coaches are the ones that step back and just let the students do what they want, you know, what they feel is important, but provide that framework for them so if they need to meet with school board or school council, they can help them figure out how to do that. Um, and we also we want to help increase knowledge about energy and, and opportunities and, and be current what's happening in the world right now that's so relevant. Okay, energy and weather that's been happening. Um, So, yeah, so just back on the types of projects, we talked about super mileage cars. Um, one thing I want to highlight here is the B3, which the Westbrook Walnut Grove has actually helped the city enter their B3 data. So that is a role that we need to see. Wait, is that good? Waste is always the one that's a low hanging fruit. So when a team starts, they'll often do an assessment and realize they're not recycling stuff. Even in Alexandria, we just we just built a new certified school. It's gorgeous, and my son came home and said, "Mom, there's no recycling stuff." And you know, they kept me telling me everything that I can about stuff. Well, mom did it. That makes it uncool. Sorry. Right. I know. I tried. So, but now they do. You know, they use things that. Love to do um, to put together e waste. We have a team that um, has e waste, cell phones, emergency lights, and cell phones are something that's really been growing um, in interest. We love the spicer has a filter on the solar panels that we have, and they will agree that go into their from school programs, aquaponics. Our first ever statement competition. So, as I mentioned, we have a regional school club. So, each region does their own competition, and the competition is based on how well they do on the play. It's teamwork, goal setting, implementation, how well did they, um, what are their, their impact numbers, how, how much waste did they reduce, how much energy did they save. And then we have a panel session that meet with the team to see how the team is. Yeah. 
that's what I love to see uh, partnerships within the room to help expand is that authentic youth engagement is what you talked about Larry and Alan and Mike with the I have experience. Um, youth doing these action projects, oftentimes they start within the school walls, but very soon the passion of the students is too big for the school walls. And it needs to go beyond. And so having an avenue to allow that to happen is great. The, the teams that have been successful at that, now those community leaders will come to the yes team first when they're thinking about doing something and use them as their research arm, use them as their advocacy arm, use them really to make an impact in the community. And the empowerment that that does for the students is far enough. So it, it's just awesome to see all of these students doing things starting small and growing to bigger and bigger projects within their, within their community. So it's been it's stepping back to where we are now today after 10 years to what those of us who sat around the table and got you know, started in the very beginning, what we envisioned it doing, it has done, I can honestly say, way more than we really thought it was capable of doing. So, Anything you want to add? Um, well, I guess I'll just say, you know, this is me with Michelle's uh, video a little bit, and I think she's been a team that researching different places of writing, which I found very mature and I think and so I think the tours that they do 
that, that makes that connection with that community. Say that wastewater facility or a um, native rain garden. Uh, so I think that's how they really connect. And we bring in those experts too for our workshops and our fall summit. And that, that's excellent. And if their if their city is agreed to the city, they could at least be look at the putting in best practices and see which one of these is our project fit with or something. Right. Yeah, there'd be, understand that. there'd be a great connection to understand what a Green Step City is and requires, and then they could be part of that solution. I'm really excited to see a 24.6 connection. I think we'll tie right into that. And, and just like you said, harnessing that energy of the students to get those projects done, then they can drive by and see that pollinator garden that they did 10 years ago. Um, and, and that, that's I've always thought that theoretically any cost savings that a project uh, that a student would in a school, <laughs> those cost savings theoretically could flow to yes or could flow to the green team or whatever. Has any, anyone like kind of put you know pushed the school? I mean, I mean, theoretically, it really there should be some like shared saving, you know. Right, right. In fact, there's a program called um, Pay from Savings from the USGBC. And, but I don't, but why I've asked for an example of the school that's implemented it so they can use it as an example, and I haven't gotten, I haven't gotten the reply yet um, or an example. Because I, you're actually right, we talked about that for years. Um, there's examples that we have of like Atwater, Atwater Cosmos Grove did a retrofit and save. They save five thousand dollars a year, and that was probably eight years ago. We're continuing to save that every year. They aren't going back to the old practices, you know. So, and the, the, the little theater retrofit that was, or solar installation that was done some years ago as well, that was saving saving up about five hundred bucks a month on their TV utility costs for that little building that the school actually owns. Uh, yeah, so and we 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 looked at that. We talked with people. I think. One of the challenges we have with that is in rural communities, they feel that their, their funding mechanisms are already pretty low, and so anytime they're saving money, they're putting it back into education. Um, and uh, that's why one of the reasons that I think uh, we're seeing a stronger um, interest in having this be curriculum and, and getting actual courses in the, in the classroom, and in addition to kind of Club because then um, there's more funding a school can get for education than there is for after school clubs such as this for green clubs. Um, so there might be it, yeah, it might be easier for a school to do that pace for saving if it was part of curriculum versus part of an after school. Great, that's a great, great idea. So um, it looks like you're being pretty proactive about like here are the, where the Green Step cities overlap with our um, yeah, team. What are your suggestions, I guess, for either group? Um, how should cities that really want to tap into the power of um, the youth in their communities, what's the best way to get started with that? Is it just to like email you to you call? Or, um, I have a rack, we call them rack cards down there with our information on them. But I think if there's already a, a yes team, um, contact the school and find out who the coach is for the yes team. They can directly work with them and they can directly work with us. That would be a great, great idea. If you want to start a yes team in your city, contact me and we can, I'll put you, uh, we'll talk about, talk about more and then get you connected with a coordinator here. Material that are developed, we have a coach handbook and a, that the coaches can use um, that we've developed over the last 10 years. So it's a, it's a curriculum, I think that we believe, but it's a, a handbook. Yeah. Well, it's experiential learning, so it's, it's curriculum. It's very experiential. Yeah. Dan, I would say, too, the other thing was um, we've always wanted to see, and I think Green Steps provides an opportunity for that as well as possibly iMatter, but 
um, in a perfect world, there'd be a teacher coach as well as a community coach that co-coach the team. Because now you have that community connection. I don't know, maybe it's not as true in, in the metro area, but in the rural communities, schools are not necessarily well connected in their community with community leaders outside of the school board um, and maybe the mayor. Um, and teachers especially don't often know who in the community leaders are working on what. There's a disconnect a little bit between schools and their community. And so um, I think if there's a Green Step City community member, um, making that connection back to that school be a two-way street that can really build, build on the passion of the business. Well, I guess, yeah, fake that in a little more. Fake that in. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, Yeah, some of them can't make it very often because they have things going on. We have attendance policies. 
that jumped out at me. I was pretty naive. I saw the process of realizing ideas and creating action work, being a part of the youth generation, to get better understanding. Yeah. Uh, some, and one of the early things that uh, we actually had the youth commission involved with was the uh, splash pad, and we actually rolled out plans, and they were actually able to inform our designers as well as the uh, amenities that they thought they wanted. Uh, on the right. 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 Yep. Uh, so the membership for us open to residents between 14 and 18. Uh, they're one-year terms and they can be reappointed. Council appoints after an application and interview process. So our interviewing has gotten much larger years because the commission has actually increased. Uh, we did notice the two uh, two chairs that uh, spoke are actually what I call a second iteration. They are actually younger brothers and sisters of commissioners that had been previously gone through. So they kind of got it and they came around and their uh, their older siblings were not council chairs or commission chairs, but uh, they certainly have taken on the uh, leadership role. Uh, a couple other comments from uh, Jack and Colette, like learning about developments and having a voice in that discussion, feeling that we're doing something to help change our community for the better. Rosemont has a strong tradition of volunteerism and getting the kids involved in uh, different ways of doing that. So again, 2009 we established, and this was, this was a little boring part, 2010 was kind of a tough year establishing mission and bylaws, uh, but they came up with these to represent and articulate the needs of the youth, cultivate future leaders through engagement, providing leadership opportunities and to participate in government. Uh, yeah, as I recall, that was a tough year. <laughs> wasn't a lot of fun, but one of the things that uh, came out of that is that they had to get involved in doing something. And I, I would be uh, remiss without pointing out that one of the first things they did was partner with our Rosemont Area Arts Council and got involved with understanding. This group is, uh, let's say, elder volunteers, uh, my age is older, and we had a thing that uh, we were trying to establish some type of uh, deal with the Rosemont Business Council, and so the annual holiday tree lighting. So this is kind of an economic development thought, and the kids came up with they wanted to sponsor a swing dance, and they sponsored it with partnered with uh, uh, the Arts Council uh, for a couple of years. Uh, you'll see a lot of things that they're partnering with our Park and Rec Department, certainly the best, the Splash Pet Celebration now. They go off and participate with city officials 1990. Our Leprechaun Day is, is our community festival in July. Uh, learning about city departments and operations, I think, was probably the biggest uh, eye opener for a lot of them, being able to go through. And um, the one thing I'll say about the kids is this tremendous ability to um, zero in on issues that we as council members, adults in the community, um, kind of fight through and they zero through walking through our police department so that they don't have enough room, they need a bigger facility. Which we kind of knew that, but we've been, as adults, we kind of push that off a little bit, keep pushing it off because of taxes and reality of that kind of finding money for things. So they're getting open up to those type of deals. I think the, the latest one we've got coming up now that they've shown an interest in is they want to go see a water tower. They drive by this thing all the day they provide water, you know, they turn on the faucet, but they really don't know what that behind the scenes is, and this has really been giving them that opportunity. Um, they do advise city council. Uh, we actually send advisory papers saying that they're uh, in support of something. One of the first goals that they came up with uh, that was a concern for a, a fair number of the youth is they were looking for summer jobs. And of course, on our dock, it was economic development, so that kind of married together uh, a need and so one there, there was two things there one they wanted jobs and yes they wanted some place to eat like Chipotle <laughs> so th there is a reality of where where their needs were um, and fortunately you know it took a few years but uh, we actually have a Chipotle now that's uh, operating in our town but uh, a lot of these kids feel that they actually had a part in driving that to our town and along with that Arby's opened, Culver's, Chipotle, and I think 
think at least three or four of our convention commission members actually work at those establishments now. So they're actually seeing this type of thing uh, come to fruition. We've conducted at least one major youth summit and goal setting session uh, with the community, uh, something that we'll probably revisit again. And then uh, seen in one of the other programs, uh, they established a legacy tree growth program. Uh, some other comments, what they like most uh, is having a say in making decisions in the community, connecting to the city of Rosemont, the hearts of the youth. These are unsolicited comments. Uh, I, I'm really amazed at you know, what comes out of these kids' mouths. Um, current goals, um, you can see the major things, grow, live, and manage uh, our, our overall city goals. With this, the youth were able to come up with things, uh, supporting youth-related facilities. Again, here was the continuing the support of new and existing business opportunities, uh, promoting youth volunteerism, uh, actually going after some facilities. They, uh, there's a facility of uh, having some, a larger field house or a court space, uh, skate park upgrade. Uh, we had one individual, he was on the uh, commission for four years, and he's seen how long it takes to kind of push that through. Uh, at least it is in our capital budget, uh, probably 2020, but he had four years in on this before it got there. Uh, increasing the community presence, uh, again, current and new RAC partnerships uh, has been really instrumental in uh, getting them involved in the community. Other partnerships, uh, one reaching out to our neighborhood and family resource center, and using the Splash Pet event, one for fun, but also for collecting food uh, for that uh, shelter. Other gathering areas, uh, one thing in our Central Park, that's been a kind of a, uh, a theme over the years is they would like to have a big bonfire event. We just don't have the facility to do that, but they can continue to push for that. And then uh, uh, over 2016-17, we established the tree planting event. Uh, as noted earlier, Emmy, the, uh, a lot of these kids are already in these student organizations. They're in band, they're in choir, um, council, and all those, uh, some of the best and the brightest, those kids' athletics. Uh, we have one of the two brothers that played the doubles that were in the state tennis this year. So a wide range of uh, individuals. Uh, they like being involved. Here's somebody that's been here all her life and to be part of the change and recognizing that. Uh, one thing I'll note on it seems like we have an awful lot of kids there, um, and, and do to some extent. We run our uh, program so that we actually bring on new commission members in May, and then we have an event that's kind of a handoff, so the old commission members and the new commission members, and they and they do the trees, uh, trees planting event. And we found that that works really well for kind of transferring that knowledge and acknowledging that now the new group seniors are leaving, is taking over over the summer, and because they've already established their goals uh, in reestablishing our next goals here in January, uh, this group has already kind of figured out what, what has happened in the past, and so now we have this continuation between the groups. Uh, this was a little bit out of uh, the specific one of establishing a tree event. Uh, it was first done in 2016. We uh, planted three trees. Uh, these were specifically picked out, an oak, a honey locust, and an accolade elm, so this is the replacements, uh, so that you don't get Dutch elm disease. Um, highlighting diversity, strength, and beauty. And so now we have a map that uh, those locations are laid out, so people can go see that. So they have an electronic version as well as something that's actually out in the city. Um, like going to different events and experiences, unique events, night to night, and the tree lighting ceremony. Uh, we went out uh, this August, and kids were able to go in the uh, bag unit, police cars, fire trucks, things that uh, hopefully you wouldn't want to see your kids in a police car, but they to get a chance to see them. <laughs> uh, a good feeling, something like that. And then they're, they're sharing that out with the neighborhood. So now these kids are out there with council, uh, with our uh, public service people out in the communities and getting a feel for, uh, for that. Uh, we use uh, different things, uh, different electronic uh, venues.
I used was this was a simple ask on who do you want to have come to talk to us? And so they all have kind of a say. And so we probably will have uh, somebody from the police department, the fire department, park and rec. Um, we're too interested in fighting people, I guess. So. <laughs> but we've, we've, we've used this as also kind of a uh, open your eyes to opportunities for careers. And then this was interesting things to tour. Uh, public works building, this is kind of where the water tower I think fell into. Uh, we have uh, in Dakota County, the uh, Dakota County Communication Center and the 911 Center has always been a, a, a big thing for them and understanding what goes on in there. And uh, Sydney really loved being a hard high schoolers taking an active role, uh, sharing our opinions, amazing to interact with council members, the mayor, as well as community members. That kind of sums up uh, really a nice, uh, nice state. Yeah. So, with that, uh, any questions? This is a little more traditional, I think, for establishing a, a commission again as an advisory council. Uh, but uh, as from the city council's perspective, we do really rely on them to actually put forth things. Maybe I help drive that. Yeah, uh, I have yet to meet with your um, environmental task force members at our Dakota County workshop with your trustee, and they're really go-getters. They really know a lot. And, um, and do you have a thought, perhaps, of seeing if you could have youth being part of the environmental task force and then eventually working with the mayor to create a permanent commission for the you know environment and sustainability task force? What I think we'll do is decide on uh, the environmental task force. So our community is a star community. It's the only one in Minnesota. And so one of the directions, we, we gave them kind of a short window, and they're supposed to come back to us with recommendations. So we're actually looking for them to come back to us. And I would hope that one of those recommendations would be for them to continue to exist. Yeah. So I don't know if they know that yet, but I've tried to push that in a couple of times. Youth members are available. Uh, but nobody's really taken that up. And like, like what we find is these kids are very busy and stuff. Uh, we've tried to be amenable, so you know, you want them available to participate in things. And a lot of times they're there, but they do have school work and athletic events and things like that. So one of the research is school for environmental studies, where there was uh, youth from Rosemont last year from SES that wanted to plug in. So if you maybe just visit the School for Environmental Studies, they can find you a couple of youth for your, you know, the environmental task force. Actually, one of our um, youth commissioners right here, Jacob, is a student. Okay, great. Uh, what's really difficult is these kids all want to do everything. Okay, They've yeah. got huge ideas and plans, and yeah. then they go away for the month, and then they come back, and it's, it's a little, like, reigniting them, I guess. Right. So, um, we do have a former council member who is on the Colorado Rest. Um, right. And her daughter was actually a former youth commission member. She decided she was too busy with senior year, but she has bad interests like her mother, so she probably didn't have some. Yes. So we do have youth concern. It's just this group has got a little bit of everything that they're involved with. And I think part of maybe a little different twist for Green Steps and sustainability, but this is, we're looking at future leaders here. We're looking for staff uh, and actually just citizens recognizing that when they are part of the community, there is a sustainability about how to keep the community going. And certainly for us, it's been volunteerism. And they've, they've taken up that charge. Is there a formal like, council work session um, yearly meeting with the uh, yeah, I think I yeah, yeah, right there. So when we talk about an interview process, that's uh, it. That's okay. That's it. Uh, uh, we used to do a little bit more, and you know, you set them across the table and grill them. But right. you know, they, this works actually a little better. We throw some pizza at them, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and they start talking. And, and I can tell you that it was probably four, four or five years ago we sat down for a goal session, just the, the youth commissioners. And ask them what were the things that were in their, their mind. Uh, one was the jobs. 
the second one was more of a uh, nature-based. Uh, we have a Carol's Wood that has been kind of overgrown by buckthorn, and so that showed up on the list to uh, to eradicate that. And that's something that this year is actually on our capital improvements project to do that. Um, they came up with they needed more space and play, so they were supporting athletic facilities. And then the fourth one was the police department said they needed more expansion. Now, in their mind, we can just run out and go build that stuff and do those things. Uh, but they're recognizing, you know, and those four ideas those became part of uh, city council's goals for the year. And it took a while, you know, some of those things are a little longer term. We've embraced that. So I can tell you that I just get really jacked up <laughs> and energized with these kids. And they come in and um, sometimes they like to do a lot of different things and you kind of kind of steer them down a path and not saying no, but giving them the opportunity to fail. And we had an event, uh, they wanted to do an event around Valentine's Day. I see. And they didn't really have that vision long term how long it would take to kind of put that all together. Now, they surprised me a little bit and said, well, we can do this little app thing and we can do group meetings and stuff like that. And I'm like, all right, well, let's do that. Now, as it turned out, the, the weather was too warm, actually, for the ice skating. But they were all, you know, they had everything all lined up, and then it was like, nope, well, not happening. We're on to something else. And uh, so I give them a lot of credit. So the, the process worked, just the event failed. <laughs> And also on top of that, also in addition to the actual, this would be happening in probably March, April-ish that the new commissioners are being interviewed. Um, and then around that same time, the current chairperson, we saw Megan on the video, she would have been this last chairperson. She just graduated in the spring. Um, so she comes before council at a council meeting and gives an official report. So they hear what the commission has been doing all year long. So she's graduated and then the new commission or a new chairperson is, is elected and that was Jaron. Uh, he really wanted to be here today, but the second day of school was senior. Yeah. So it didn't quite work out, but so I, I like that you guys have this transition plan, you know. Um, I was just curious, that was an ambitious list of goals up there. Um, two slides worth. Um, and I was just curious how much do the goals change year over year depending on the interest of the youth commissioner? So one of the activities uh, is this like uh, there's actually a, a third member of this group, a uh, past council member, Kim Shukorga, who um, chose not to run, but she's still in the community. She's a teacher at Egan High School and is still on our board. And so one of the things that she's brought is how do we get these kids to interact? So it's one thing to put all these kids together now. How do we go about doing it? So what we've done is we've set up long-term and short-term goals. And so that they, they pair off three to five, depending on what it is. And then they actually have a, there's a system. So one is kind of a leader, one's a recorder, one will actually speak in the group. So they all have different roles. And then that rotates around. So every meeting, uh, we may have some time cut away for different things like that. So the long term may go more than one year. And so then there's this group that are always connected. I mentioned like the state park that was an ongoing goal. And now it's still going even though that individual that was just kind of driving it was left. So she's getting the fixed up and saying, yeah, we need to come back and do this. So but there is some continuity there. Yeah, and now kids can bring in some of their new ideas. And I would say we've probably learned that over the last four to five years. That was not something in 2010 that we started out with. And we kind of learned when we were making selections how to get that continuity, that transition, and then uh, also opening up more. We started originally, I think, with just two positions, one chair and vice chair. We created two vice chairs now. And we try to make sure that one of them was like we may have a senior, but we try to get That's the other thing we try to look at is make sure that we've got freshmen, sophomores, and juniors as well as seniors. Otherwise, we would be all top heavy seniors. Everybody wants to have that. So we recognize that. And uh, there is some pushback, really challenging. Like you said, we have one gal who says, you know what, I'm just too busy this year. She was involved in like five years. And we've had people who come on in middle school and they've for years and they want to come on. Five years. Five years. So um, they they never fail to um, surprise us, but they 
want, you know, they've done a survey of who would have thought they wanted to go to the wetlands. I mean, that's, that's something that was probably very important to all of you, but we didn't know that until we surveyed them because we think of our um, community, community and department as kind of like going to the and something that um, is kind of interesting, we've uh, probably got more uh, young ladies involved, uh, so the guys are starting to figure out that effective thing to get involved. But I think, you know, from a diversity perspective, I think we're, we, we, we've improved on that. We've uh, got kids of color, um, all that type of thing, and for all these kids, they don't even recognize it. You know, these are, these are friends. Well, we have shy kids and outgoing kids, and they all just fight under the We've had, um, I'm calling it challenge, whatever the political director is, but special learning. Special learning. But uh, uh, to see her grow over four while she was in, I think, four years. And by the time she was a senior, she was actually one of the most good. So had, you know, her peers had recognized her. There's two presenters left, and they're going to have about two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I just have three slides here. We thought uh, it would be important to say something about uh, uh, sort of the group behind a Green Step uh, City Coordinator in our city. So I'm Phil Music. So, um, so we, when cities join Green Step City, they identify a person, a coordinator, uh, so that we all know so who is that contact person. But really, the so the questions are like, who is that person working with, and um, how does Green Step become more than just this? Oh, geez, this is a little, this is this add-on thing something that the city is doing. So um, next slide here. So this is in this. Best practice 24.1, so a city that gets recognized at step three level uh, needs to have some sort of group, some sort of committee. Uh, and so here's sort of a mapping out of the different types of groups that can be high, that can really be working with that green step coordinator be behind that uh, uh, coordinator. And depending on the city, we have so such a range of cities across Minnesota. Sometimes we simply have a staff a green team. Sometimes we have uh, a citizen or a, a civic group that does not have any formal links to the city, but the city council. So our first, um, up, uh, our first Green Step city, Pine River, in central Minnesota. The Green Step committee was this Greater Pine River area, LC Green community. It was this long, sort of complex group that was working on a number of issues, and they sort of took on Green Step cities and engaged with them. Um, and then, of course, there's the formal city groups that can be commissions, task force, uh, uh, a number of different structures. And those structures can include a range of people, and we certainly encourage this, a range that includes uh, elected officials, uh, staff, and then people from the community, so youth, uh, business representation, uh, baby community. So here's sort of the so next slide, next slide. Um, so we had on the Green Step Cities, we, gra uh, we grabbed as a, as a resource piece for uh, cities with a committee or a commission or some sort of group. Uh, we grabbed a, a sort of 10 tips from the groups of St. Old Jersey, which is a Green Step Cities um, uh, similar program out in New Jersey. And we realized, well, we have a lot of learning. We've heard a lot from uh, uh, especially in the metro area, um, there's uh, uh, commissions, committees that are supporting Green Step Cities. So we put together, and uh, I have a copy of the sort of first draft here, and in a couple of weeks we'll, we'll put it on the Green Step Cities website. But um, grab this, and if you have any sort of thoughts, ideas on sort of the content of uh, these sort of tips. But I, I think the, the sort of obvious ones, and we certainly saw this with the Rosemount Community Commission, is having a uh, some sort of guiding principles, uh, uh, charter, um, uh, 
mission statement. Uh, having strong leaders, thinking about transition of leaders. Um, leadership succession, really, really key. We're seeing that now that Green Sub Cities, some of them are seven years old. Um, clarifying who's sort of on the committee, the range of that. Regular meetings, uh, boring but useful. Finding the work, sharing, engaging with city uh, staff and other, um, other uh, city uh, groups. Connecting with the city, again, some of our green stuff cities, uh, the, the, really the impetus comes not from the city council or staff, but it's coming from the civic groups. So we have tips on sort of clarifying um, decision making, uh, issues of does a, does a, a green stuff committee talk sort of engage directly with the city council, does it go through staff? Uh, there have been some tensions, conflicts uh, on that issue. So again, the sort of tip sheet has some um, some thoughts, work plan. Again, just basic sort of stuff, and then this sort of communication engagement because different, you know, some some people on a on a on a group they want to do projects, they want to plant trees. Uh, some people want to uh, advise city council. And then there's some people just want to get out there and sort of engage with, educate, learn from uh, community members. So, so there are really three different roles that, that any commission can play. Ideally, the commission plays all three. Um, but being clear about sort of what, who's doing what and why. Okay, so that's it. Um, again, we'll post this uh, in a couple of weeks after we get some more feedback. So, so that's step. And so I think we're going to talk about social media. How appropriate, you know, quick tweets. Yeah, okay. okay, all right, Danielle from the League of the Defense Cities. And uh, maybe some other people. Yeah, I okay. have a co presenter today.
can just walk the stroll in the city hall and, and have their voice heard. All right, the engagement toolbox. There are, these are just a couple examples of ways that you can use social media to engage populations. On the right, I apologize for that break in the line. We have a Twitter conversation using a hashtag, move equity. Uh, um, their Twitter is a really robust place for conversations about um, the industry, uh, pedestrian use, uh, sustainability topics, broad spectrum, any kind of way that you want to nerd out about sustainability or uh, community access. There is a community for you on Twitter that wants to talk about it. And there are people on Twitter that don't know that they want to talk about it, but you're going to find them, and those are your new allies. Um, and uh, the people that you can connect with in the future to uh, grow your capacity on issues. On the left here, we have the city of Lindstrom on Facebook uh, talking about uh, something very simple, registering for a volunteer event. Just getting that out in front of eyeballs is how you're going to uh, start forging those relationships. City of West St. Paul, this is a different example of what uh, community engagement on social media can look like. They rolled out a discussion for their comprehensive plan, and you can see, you can't read this, I'm sorry, but uh, in the text you can tell that they did this through multiple avenues. There were probably in-person community meetings, I know there were. Uh, they had a web page where people could submit survey comments, and they're also reaching out to people on social media uh, who maybe didn't know about it, have never been to the city's website before, don't have the time to go to a community meeting, so that you're really maximizing your reach. And this is one way that they did it. So I would like to emphasize that social media isn't going to replace any of your traditional tools. It's going to be a really important supplement to moving forward. Uh, first step, and we're just going to look through these, but if you ever have any questions about using social media, A, other cities are great resources. So talk to your neighbors, talk to uh, cities that you see on social media being active that you think are doing really great work. And of course the League is always here to help answer those questions as well. You can reach out to myself, you can reach out to the team, uh, John Reeder, our public affairs director. Uh, we're all happy to help you think through logistics like that. So number one, identify your audience and goals. You can't skip that step. Uh, that gives you direction and purpose if you are talking specifically about uh, a youth commission and you want to have an account specifically for that, then your uh, steps are going to be different than if you want to set up an account for your city that doesn't have one yet and is going to be like a general information uh, broadly focused site. You want to monitor the space, see what other accounts are out there that are talking about the issues that you want to be talking about. Uh, scale, set clear and livable expectations. I totally made that up. But uh, I like it because sometimes you may just be charged with do social media and what does that really mean? What are people expecting you to be doing? Or, you know, are you going to be the most active site in the community ever? Are you posting five times a day? Or do you just want to be establishing a presence? You know, um, do you want to start building uh, that network and who do you have in terms of staff capacity to do that as well as resources? So, being very clear and then scaling what your expectations are for what you actually have to work with is a really important uh, thing to do in your first step. Uh, number four is related to that, the who, what, when, where, why, and how of things. Have that conversation before you set up your account and password so that uh, you aren't passing the buck between people that don't really want to do it or didn't know that they were going to be expected to do it. Um, don't have a skill set, but would have benefited from you know, some time to prepare before you're actually launching something. And then uh, a, pol a policy conversation. There was once a day where you could launch a social media account <coughs> and maybe not have a social media policy in place, not have a comment policy in place and kind of wing it. We have moved out of that stage. These are things that you at least want to have a plan for as you're developing these resources. Um, again, something that the League and other cities can help you with. So don't be intimidated by that. Just have it on your radar and know where you're going with it before you get started. Best practices. All right, promote your account. It sounds so simple, but sometimes people don't do it. Have links on your homepage. Put them in your traditional newsletters. Talk about them at your council meetings. Talk about them 
at your community events because people may not be assuming that these things are out there, particularly if you have social media that's tied to something new like a, a youth commission or a volunteer project or you have something really uh, specific. Don't assume. Key messages. This is something that Don Reeder would also love to talk to you about, our public affairs director. Make sure that when you are writing social media posts that you're thinking about the values of your organization as well as the facts. Um, when you patch those two together, like, like a nice burrito, we call those two messages. Um, and they're really effective communication tools. <laughs> okay, images and video. Uh, kind of a no-brainer, but don't be intimidated by it either. Uh, incredibly effective in terms of uh, reaching people, uh, effectively uh, delivering those values sometimes in terms of a visual image can communicate just as well as you know, a paragraph of you talking about, for example, how beautiful the city is and the natural resources that they have. Um, if you want examples, government politics on Facebook is a Facebook account that just uh, they share video from across the globe, all different types of organizations, uh, national, multinational, all the way down to local uh, video that governments are doing. And that's kind of neat. So you can see what everyone else is doing. Uh, there's a wide range of quality on there, and that's okay. Sometimes you need to just be thinking about the message and content. Be a good neighbor. Partner, you know, we have partner organizations in real life reflect those connections on social media. That's another way to reach uh, new populations that maybe don't know about your accounts or don't know the value that you can be uh, delivering on those accounts. Uh, okay, and last but not least, crunch the numbers. There are now a lot of really great uh, native analytics tools in these platforms. Don't obsess about them right away. Know that they're there. Keep your eye on them um, and use them to uh, make choices as you move forward and as you learn about what your community is responding to, not responding to, what you may want to evolve. And I'm going to hand it back to you. Okay. It really is like a real. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So as Danielle mentioned, I'm going to be talking about some of the areas of concern for social media. Um, Especially from a legal point of side, so this is a fun part for an attorney, um, including the Open Meeting Law, um, uh, Records Retention, the Data Practices Act, um, and some other legal considerations as well. Um, so, as it relates to Open Meeting Law, I think we're all familiar with that in terms of um, the Open Meeting Law requiring public bodies to be open to uh, the public in general. Um, there are some exceptions to that, uh, but in general, um, the, the purpose of the law is to uh, promote transparency and openness in government. Um, and that transparency and openness in government, that idea translates um, onto online services like social media as well. Um, an example of this too here is um, uh, the social media exception to the open meeting law. Um, so in 2014, the state legislator added a social media exception, uh, which we, uh, you can read it here, uh, but just is specifically for public officials. Um, if they're going to be using social media, uh, the exchanges on social media have to be uh, open to the general public. Uh, so if they're going to be talking about city business uh, on Facebook or on Twitter, uh, their profile can be. Uh, private, it has to be open for everyone to theoretically see if they can access it on a, on a phone, an iPad, or a computer, of that nature. Um, so that's why we recommend for public officials uh, on council uh, commissions and boards to, uh, if they're going to be using social media, it's important to check the privacy settings. Um, some might be, especially on Facebook, you can kind of filter it to uh, people who follow you or your friends and family. Um, but making sure that's open to the public as a whole. If you're going to be discussing city business on social media. Uh, another important area to consider with social media is records retention. Um, so we, uh, every city has a records retention policy or schedule. And most of what's going to be posted on social media doesn't need to be kept unless it serves as an official record for the city. Uh, so an example of this is the city uh, meeting minutes. 
Um, so if the council decides to post a link to the meeting minutes on social media to let people know what happened at the last council meeting, um, that post doesn't need to be kept uh, because the, the link that they sent it to is the official record of uh, government action. So the actual meeting minutes need to be kept, um, but the post on social media doesn't. Um, a counterexample to that is if there is a complaint online, uh, say if a resident posts or a message um, a city or a city department about a potential nuisance violation, um, that should be kept um, because the city is being notified of that. Um, you would obviously want to follow up with that resident as well to make sure you get the proper address so you can investigate the, the nuisance. So that would need to be kept under its records retention schedule. Um, so the best thing to uh, think about in terms of social media posts uh, or messages is to um, say, does it uh, does this post or message serve as the official record of city uh, action? Uh, if it does, um, then check the records retention schedule to see how long it should be kept or stored. <coughs> Uh, finally, um, data practices. Um, so social media posts, um, even if most of them are unofficial records, they're still government data and can be um, the subject of a data request. Um, so something that we do recommend, especially for public officials, um, but for also uh, city staff as well, is to have separate uh, social media accounts. Um, so if you do have a council member or a public official that's very active on social media, um, recommend them having their own social media account for city business, um, and then they can have their own personal account as well. Um, that way, if there is a data request at all, um, you don't have to sift through uh, public and private information um, or social media posts. You can just kind of go through that public page and get that data um, from specifically from that page. So it's similar to um, separate emails as well, which we recommend, having a city email and your personal email. Uh, and this can work with city staff as well. Um, so some cities, uh, various departments, um, have their own social media page, so police departments, fire departments, public works, uh, parks and recs. Um, if employees are authorized to post on those page, um, it's best for them to post on that official page rather than posting on their own personal page. Some resources that we do have um, at the league, especially in our resource department, research department, uh, we do have a webinar on social media. Uh, this steps um, a little bit more in depth. It's about 40 minutes. That's a good resource. Um, something that Danielle mentioned as well is policy. Uh, so we do have a lot of model policies um, in our computer uh, computer network loss control memo. Uh, we have social media policies and computer use policies. Um, if you don't have that already, or if you want to uh, double check, that's all, always a good resource. Any questions at all? Uh, we are over time, so if you have to leave, please don't hesitate to do so. And if you have questions, feel free to contact any of us, but we can. Yeah, I think actually, if you have questions, then hang out. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys for coming. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, of course. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Um, and thank you all for sticking around for an extra 15 minutes. Um, I think it was a really good conversation all the way through and hearing about all these different tools and activities that are going on with, with the youth around the state. And so um, it's really cool to see and it's nice to be in a, a space for a couple of hours where you can see all the positive stuff that is going on in the state. So thank you to all of our presenters and um, our next uh, workshop is October 4th. We'll be talking about organic um, We'll also send out more information about the, the series going forward this year. I think that we have a lot of really good workshops lined up for you all. Um, we're actually going to take one of them on the road, and in December we'll be in St. Cloud. Um, so we'll try a little bit of mobility with our workshops and see how that works. We can do that next year as well. So thank you all. Have a lovely short week, um, and we'll see you in October. Thank <laughs> you.